Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Rob Waring, and I'm going to be talking today about Extensive Reading 101. These are the absolute basics for people new to Extensive Reading. And maybe you're here because you have heard something about Extensive Reading, and you want to learn something about the absolute basics. What are the essential elements of Extensive Reading? So let's compare Extensive Reading with Study Reading. Extensive reading means reading a lot of easy books to build reading speed, fluency, and building comprehension skills. Notice that this is about developing the skill of reading. Study reading, by comparison, is to intensively study the language to learn new words, grammar, and language features. So, in EFL, how are students typically taught to read? What is the normal way that students are taught to read? Well, they're typically taught with some kind of a reading textbook, something like this one. Now, this book here is very typical of a reading textbook. It may not be exactly like the one that you use, but it is probably very similar. So let's look at some of the features. The first thing is that uh, the text is short, uh, maybe two or 300 different words, and there are many difficult words. And the idea here is for those words to be taught and the students will learn them. Sometimes you may find that there are some uh, a dictionary, some definitions may be given. After the reading, usually there are some follow-up activities. So for example, here we have comprehension activities, or we may have, as you can see, words in context. Uh, you may have some grammar activities over here. So these are usually all different types of activities which uh, students uh, will need to do to follow up the reading. And this is the typical approach that many, many students uh, adopt when they are learning to read. So, a reading classroom often looks like this. And here you can see that the student is working on the textbook. Notice something important here. Everybody's reading the same book. Everybody's doing the same thing. Everybody's on the same page. And importantly, look what the student has in her hand. They have a pen. And this shows that they're doing pen work, they're doing exercises, they are studying, they are studying the text itself. And as I said, this is good because we're trying to get them to learn something. So in the textbook, it may look something like this. This is the table of contents for the first uh, few uh, chapters. So let's look a little bit more carefully at the first units one to four or the around here. And I want you to notice something about this. Notice that in this particular book, uh, chapter three is about uh, my favorite things. Four is about whose clothes are these. Five is about the house and furniture and rooms. Six is about work and leisure. Seven is about lifestyles and so on. If you notice also that the, the topic is different here, here, the grammar that they're talking about is also different. Here we have the be verb, here we have have got, here we have prepositions of place, here we have present simple, and pronunciations different as well. Notice something important here. In a traditional syllabus design, students will meet unit one and they'll have some new grammar, for example, the be verb, and maybe some simple adjectives. In unit two, they would have some more grammar and some more new vocabulary. Unit three, again, more new grammar, more new vocabulary, more new grammar, more new vocabulary, and this continues. And if you think about the book that you use, it probably is something like this. And this is what we call a linear design. The word linear comes from the word line. And notice something important. Notice that the topic of this particular unit, the adjectives here that I used, are probably not going to occur again in unit two. These sporting activities are probably not going to appear in unit eight, which is about health, 
or unit 12, which is about, for example, traveling. So the theory behind this traditional design is we only need to teach something one time, then we can move on. And we call this one hit learning. That is, we teach something, we assume that it has been learnt because we've done it, and therefore we can move to something new and we don't need to repeat it. Here we move on to the next unit because we know that it's been done. We know the students have finished learning. Here, the students now move on to the present continuous because they finish the simple present, they finish the be verb, and so on and so on. That's the assumption under this design. Now, all of us know that, of course, by the time they've finished the end of unit one or unit two or unit three, of course, they haven't mastered the be verb, the simple present tense, the present continuous tense. But nevertheless, for many courses, we continue as if they did. However, an important thing to remember about the way that students learn, if over time, if you have a certain knowledge at time zero over here, what's going to happen to that? Well, we know from research going back well over 130 years that over time, knowledge will be forgotten. If you give 20 new words to your students today, how many will they remember tomorrow? How many next week? How many by the end of the semester? And if we only ever do this once, it's going to be a problem. This curve is extremely important for us to understand the relevance of extensive reading. We call it the forgetting curve. Let's look at it a little bit more carefully. So if we go back to our traditional syllabus, which is like this, what's going to happen to this knowledge? This is going to happen to the knowledge. So by the time the students get to the end of the book, of course they can't remember what happened in unit three, unit two, and unit one because the language was not recycled. This is obviously some kind of a problem for us and for the students. So the problem with using only reading textbooks is that very often the reading is presented as reading as testing. The passages are short, which means they don't meet lots of language. In fact, if there's only 250 words per unit and there are 12 units in the book and it takes you a semester or a year to get through this, they're only meeting 3,000 words in a year. That's 3,000 total words. Often, because the words are only put once or twice in the reading passage, and maybe once, possibly twice in the grammar or vocabulary activity, the words are not met enough times to be learned forever. We know from research it takes at least 10 times, often 15 or 20 times, before a word is learned. So clearly the textbook is not ensuring long-term learning. There are also very few examples of the grammar patterns. Therefore, the students are not going to deeply understand them. We know that grammar patterns take time to learn. And those of you here who are teachers, have been teaching English for a while, who are non-native speakers of English, are you completely comfortable with understanding the difference between the present simple tense, the past simple tense, and present perfect? Are you very comfortable, completely understand the use of the modal verbs? Are you okay with the, um, with the articles, at, the, and an? My guess is that probably you studied these in school, you've been teaching them for years, but still you will have some problems. What this shows is that even after all of the time that you've been doing this, it's still not probably fully learnt. So it's going to take time. And students need to meet examples of these again and again and again and again and again to deeply understand and build a sense of this. Reading textbooks generally make the reading slow and intensive and intentional. Often students have to write in their language next to words they don't know. They may need to use their dictionary and so on. The other issue is that all the students read the same material. And this doesn't matter um, uh, for, uh, for some classes, but in some classes, your book is going to be too easy for some students and too hard for others. Some students are going to be bored because it's too easy. Some students bored because it's too hard. Or it may be interesting for some, not all the topic in the book may not be interesting to others. 
Therefore, we're really restricting ourselves to teaching in the middle and we've lost say 20 or 30% of our class. This doesn't mean that reading textbooks are bad, not at all. They're very useful for teaching things. However, they have limits to what they can do. Students are going to need more than just a reading textbook. So what material should we be using to build the skill of reading? Well, EFL learners typically meet English only for a few hours a week. And often, as I said before, because they have to, not because they want to. They're there because mum has told them, the school has told them, the Ministry of Education has ordered them to be in English class. They are learning in the classroom setting. They often don't have English outside the classroom. They're going to forget quickly, as I mentioned before. So what they're going to need is systematic recycling of vocabulary and grammar. They should not be meeting random grammar and vocabulary. They should be meeting the same grammar that they learned in their course book again and again and again and again to strengthen this. Therefore, the input that they receive outside the textbook should build on previous learning, systematically build on previous learning. So the solution here is to make sure that the students read. And we'll be looking at some reading materials later. So as I said before, the reading that we need to do, we need to continue with our reading course book to introduce the language, introduce the reading skills, introduce some grammar and vocabulary. Great. However, students are going to need more. So if they've used their textbook and in unit one and unit two, they've learned the B verb and the present simple tense, then they need to read books which only deal with that grammar and vocabulary so that those words and that grammar can be deepened and strengthened and consolidated. When students are comfortable with this grammar and vocabulary and they have internalized it, then they can move to level two where they now start to look at the grammar and vocabulary from the next level. But not only are they meeting the present continuous tense and can, but they're also still continuing to meet the be verb and present simple tense, systematically building on previous knowledge and systematically deepening and consolidating that. When they get to unit three, again, the same thing's happening. So this systematic building of previous knowledge is really important, particularly in EFL, where students probably only meet English in their classroom. So the way that we do this is by using books called graded readers, and they're called graded for a reason. Graded here means simplified. These are stories written at different levels of difficulty, depending on the student. These are not books by grade school level, like grade one, grade three, grade five. No, these are graded in terms of their vocabulary. So at the very, very easy level books, there's very easy vocabulary and very easy grammar. Probably students should start with phonics before they start to read these. As the books get more and more difficult, you can see here that the vocabulary gets more difficult and the grammar gets more difficult. In the end, the students will be reading native books. So the idea is that students would start maybe with some phonics material. Then they take the very, very easy books with the very simple grammar and vocabulary, read say 20 or 30 books at that level, become comfortable reading quickly at that level. Then they move up to the next level. As they move up, their speed is going to drop a little because there's new grammar and new vocabulary, which they still need to internalize. But over time, when they've met 30 or 40 more books, then their knowledge is going to increase and they'll be able to uh, read better. And similarly, they go up and up and up and up and up. And in the end, students will be reading uh, native materials. And it's important for our students to go systematically through the levels so they can build up to native materials in the end. We have to be careful with some native materials. Native materials are written for native speakers, of course, and they are written for a very different audience. Please remember that the books that are written for native uh, children, even children who are four or five years old, are often not suitable for four or five-year-old students doing EFL. Why is that? The reason is that the books written for native speakers who are three or four years old are building on what the students already know. 
when you are four or five years old, when you start reading in a foreign language, you already know uh, maybe thousands of words. You already know lots of grammar. You can already say many, many, many things in the foreign language, in your first language. But in a foreign language, when you start at age three or four or five or eight or 12 or 16, you don't have that knowledge. You don't have that experience. Therefore, students need to have systematic input, particularly if they don't live in, a, um, in a, a, an English speaking country. So there's a relationship then between how students read. And there's a fair balance we need to have when choosing the right material for our students. Students need to be able to have a good balance of understanding, but also speed. Speed is important so students can read a lot. And we need them to read a lot because we know that students need to meet massive amounts of language. However, if the reading is slow uh, and intentional reading with high effort and frequent loss of comprehension and demotivating, we're going to have a problem. The reading in the middle, which is slow reading with many pauses, loss of comprehension, and often you need to use a dictionary. And the third type of reading is fast, fluent, with very few pauses, high comprehension, high involvement in the story. They understand what's going on and they're just lost in the story. This first type of reading we call reading pain. And please make sure that you don't give your students this. Uh, anything which is too slow is intentional reading, very high effort, very slow reading speed, lots of dictionary use is absolutely not suitable for our students. However, if maybe five or six or eight percent of the words are not known and a little bit of the grammar is not known, they can read it mostly without a dictionary, then that's OK. But that's suitable for study, study reading. Um, the type of reading students need to do to build their fluency and comprehension is extensive reading. Notice the difference. Here the boy has head in his hands, here the girl has a pencil in her hand, and here is a book. So if you want to know whether your students are doing reading pain, intensive reading, extensive reading, look at their hands. So what kind of books do the students need for extensive reading? Do they need A, books with lots of rare words, random selection of words, books that are standalone and are not in a series, books that are hard to follow or difficult, and books that keep the reading speed low, or do they need books B with high frequency useful words, which have been written, books written to recycle and strengthen the knowledge, books that work together as a system and that allow students to read smoothly and easily and with confidence and clearly these are the types of books that students need to read. And the books that we use, as I said before, are typically graded readers. And these are some examples here. Many of these books do not have comprehension questions. They are just there for reading. Some books do have comprehension questions, but honestly, most students don't use them. Most teachers don't use them. They just read the story. And there are graded readers of many, many different types, original fiction, uh, famous stories, there are stories, there are nonfiction materials, um, all kinds of different things that you can read. And there are books by dozens of publishers here. Here is just an example of a few of the publishers who have um, graded reading materials. And I'm sure that I've missed a few out here. So please check with your local distributors about what books are available. So let's look a little bit at the graded readers and what are they? How do they work? Well, at the very, very easy level, you can see that the books have very, very few words in them, not many words. And the patterns are being repeated in art class we, in art class we, in art class we, in art class we. So lots of repeated patterns, regular spellings and not many words in the book. At the next level up, Again, we're moving up a little bit more. The sentence is a little bit longer. Sentences are not getting repeated so much. We're starting to see speech here. We're starting to see paragraphs. We still have high visual support, but a very easy plot and very easy sentences, yeah? No past tenses here. No past tenses. We've got uh, present simple only. And that's because we are, the students have not yet met past tense. We're trying to strengthen the simple present tense. At the next level, 
uh, with a little bit more difficult vocabulary, a little bit more difficult grammar, more complex plot. And now uh, the students are reading something a little bit more like a natural text. At the intermediate level, fewer pictures, more difficult vocabulary, more difficult grammar, more complex plot, and there are more words in the book. At the advanced level, sometimes you may have no pictures at all. Maybe the book has 10,000 words, lots of complex phrases, uh, sentences with uh, many different clauses in them, and so on and so on. And here we're dealing with paragraphs. So graded readers take students up from one level to the other. So let's just look at a typical graded reader. Uh, this is a very simple, very easy story. You can see it's level one. And this book has only 75 different words. That's all. Only 75 different words. And I'm going to click through the slides here um, so that you can read it. As I said, 75 different words. There are 504 words total in the book. So let's just read it. I may be clicking a little too fast, so, so please feel free to stop the video. Here on the left page, you can see some vocabulary is being taught. This is essential words which the students are going to need in the story. So let's start to read here. I'll let you read quietly and then I'll move to the next page. Please click if, uh, pause if I go too quickly. So here you can see there's a very simple story and students even with two or 300 words can probably read this even slowly, but they can start to read. This means that extensive reading can be started at very low levels. They may not be reading fast and fluent ways, but if you ask them to read it again and again and again, their fluency will improve. If you don't have access to paper books, then uh, an online reading system called xreading.com. xreading.com has about 1,400 graded readers on their system, which you can access at any time um, and anywhere. Uh, it's not expensive. It's about uh, 14 or $15 per year per student, which is excellent value. Uh, it's not a free system because this uses publishers graded material and the uh, X reading people need to pay the publishers. If you uh, have a chance, please try the system. It is an excellent system. If in your school you don't have any money for a program like this, an alternative is ercentral.com. This also has reading text and listening text and also some vocabulary uh, for you to use. And this site is free. 
It's not as good as X reading because X reading has professionally written material. Um, another benefit of ER Central, Extensive Reading Central, is that it has lots of things for the teacher uh, where you can learn about extensive reading. It also allows you to, um, to manage your students. You can put your students into the system and download your data. Uh, ER Central allows you to download the data of your students in the same way that X reading does. So let's now look at a few basic questions about extensive reading. An important question we get is how much reading should they do? Well, if your students are beginning level, then an hour or week uh, at their ability level is fine. This is okay because they meet unknown words often, so they're going to learn quite quickly. Their reading speed will increase quickly because they're meeting lots of words very frequently. Intermediate level students need to read an hour a week at their ability level or more. And these books they have are thicker, but their reading speed is higher and therefore they can read more. The books are longer, but with the increased reading speed, we can increase the length of the books. So about an hour a week at their ability. However, for advanced learners, it's a bit different. Advanced learners already know lots of language. And therefore, in order to master the language, they need to meet more language in order to find things they don't know. So it might take them a few minutes before they find a word they don't know or a phrase they don't know which they need to work with. Therefore, for advanced learners, they should be increasing the reading to two to three hours a week at their ability level because they don't meet language very frequently. The next question, how do I fit extensive reading into the curriculum? Well, there's many different ways. One way that many schools do this is to have a standalone extensive reading class, a special dedicated class. Uh, if you don't have time in your curriculum to do this, you can maybe make a reading club in your school. However, typically extensive reading is brought into a normal classroom. Most teachers integrate extensive reading into a reading class or a speaking class with the ER being brought in as homework. So the students will read outside and then in the reading class, they will report what they've read. They'll talk about what they've read. They'll discuss and share ideas. Typically for extensive reading, students read at home and then they come to class ready to talk about their books. The advantage of this is that reading then is transferred into speaking and writing and listening. So often after the reading, the teacher does follow-up activities and these might involve presentations or book reports, discussions, this type of thing. An important question is, should the reading be optional or required? And as I mentioned uh, before, it's important for us as teachers to make sure that our students get this input. If the students don't get this input and we're only doing textbook work, then the students are not going to be getting the, uh, not going to be meeting the words and the grammar many, many times. They're not going to remember what's going on. They're going to forget. Therefore, we need to make sure that students are doing this. Our job as teachers is to provide the input that they need. But an important reason we need to require, to, require it is because if you ask students would you like to do this reading? Of course, the average student is going to say yes, but they don't do it. If you give students the chance to opt out, they will. Why? Because they're busy. They've got other things to do. If we say to the students it's optional, it gives the wrong message. This says it's not important. It says the textbook is important. The tests are important. Something else is important, but not the reading. Just do it if you can. And that's the wrong message from what we saw before, students must have this practice. Similarly, students will not pick up the habit of reading if they do not do it. We can't get them to be lifelong readers if we don't require them to read. Another advantage, of course, by reading is students can learn about our world and gain cultural knowledge and sensitivity. One of the reasons that students learn English is to be an international person, to learn about other cultures, other places, other people. And this is a way that they can do that. The other thing too is when the students have left our class, probably the primary way that students are going to meet English in the future is through reading, reading a newspaper or a, an article or maybe something that they read on a bus. 
um, they're probably going to meet reading more than they're going to meet any other skill. The advantage of doing it through reading is you have control over the speed. With speaking and listening, you don't have control over the speed of what you do. Reading, you can stop, look carefully, work something out, look at your dictionary if you need to. So reading is one of the primary skills for uh, learning a foreign language. Another big advantage of making it uh, required is that extensive reading can build language knowledge. It's giving the depth of practice, the consolidation of practice, the improvement in reading skill, improvement of reading speed, which can be transferred to test taking. One of the reasons that students don't do well on tests is that they can't read fast enough. They can't finish the test, so they end up guessing at the end. Their reading speed is not fast enough to be able to read the text carefully um, so that they aren't able to answer the questions. So there are knock-on effects by building reading speed and fluency. Also, extensive reading builds their text awareness. They're aware of different text types. The next question, shouldn't we teach grammar first? Well, of course, grammar is important, but we tend to teach too much of it. Grammar is late acquired and can be best to be learnt by quick explanation, then lots of practice. As I mentioned before, many teachers are still not comfortable with the tenses. They're not comfortable with the modals. Why? Because they probably haven't met language enough. And in my own personal experience, I tend to find teachers who work more on communication skills tend to have better communications of skills of their own. Teachers who tend to focus on language focus work like grammar and testing, they tend to generally have lower communication skills. And that I think is because they too don't read and they too don't listen as much. So students need to pick up the grammar patterns and build a sense of how they work. How does a grammar pattern work? How does a grammar pattern match with the vocabulary? How does this thing work in different contexts? And they can only build this sense of knowledge through meeting lots of language. So what do students need to do before starting extensive reading? Well, before they start extensive reading, of course, uh, they must know the alphabet is key. They need to know a few hundred sight words vocabulary. They need to recognize a few hundred words. Some basic grammar, maybe word order, four or five tenses, possibly the negative forms, a few basic things like that will be fine. Probably not much more than junior high school first year grammar is enough for them to be able to start reading extensively. And of course, some phonics is useful so they know how to sound words when they meet them. So build this knowledge quickly, um, but not to the level of mastery. Don't get it until they're absolutely perfect with it because that will take forever. Um, try to get them to read as soon as possible. Note that many, many students can pass a grammar test, but can't use the grammar knowledge in their speaking and writing. Why? Because they don't have enough experience with the patterns. It takes a certain amount of experience with a grammatical form or a word or a phrase before you feel ready to use it. Extensive reading and extensive listening can help build that that threshold of knowledge to allow students to be able to start to speak and start to write. So only after they've met the patterns enough times will they build a sense of how the words and grammar go together. This, as I said before, enables the skills of speaking and writing. So if students have been reading about a book, they have something to talk about. They can borrow language from the book when they're discussing it with their friends. Sort of the best materials to use for extensive reading. As I said before, graded readers. Notice that for uh, these graded readers here, these graded readers, you probably have three to 4,000 words in each uh, book. If they're reading two books a week, in one month, they'll read eight books. If each book has five or 6,000 words, that's more English than they will get from one textbook. One textbook has the same number of words as about one month of reading, or even has less than that, depending on the book itself. So um, by reading lots and lots and lots of reading something every week, once or twice a week, an hour for a week, students are very quickly going to build their language knowledge. So a next question is, how can I motivate my students to read? Easy, find interesting materials. 
everybody, everybody loves to read, but they only like to read interesting stuff. A lot of their interesting stuff is on their smartphone and they will pick up their smartphone and read it all day if they could. So we need to find that those things they're interested in. Are they interested in uh, sports or travel or are they interested in um, judo or are they interested in sewing or skateboarding or music, whatever it is, bring those materials into the classroom, ask them to bring them to the classroom, ask the students what they want to learn about. Their natural interest in that topic will help them read. It will get over their barrier. If you can bring something in that's to do with skateboarding or about pop music in Korea or wherever, then the students will read it and they will struggle through it willingly because they want to read about it. However, some students don't like reading and that's fine. If not, then get them to listen to something, bring in some uh, podcasts or bring in some reading material, TED videos, that type of thing. Next question, what do I do as a teacher? Well, your teacher's role is quite simple, actually. Your main role first is to build a library, build the materials, uh, consistently build a library. Once you've done that, you don't need to build the library again. You just need to add to it. Your next job is to help cho students choose the right materials, make sure they're finding something at their level. Then you just let them read, either at home or in class, give them class time to read and let them share and just watch, watch as they are sharing their knowledge. So as a teacher, your checklist is something like this. You need to check that the students understand why they need to read extensively. You can mention some of the points that I have mentioned. Make sure they're reading at the right level. We'll talk about that in a minute. Make sure that they understand their books and they're doing enough reading. Are they only reading a few dozen words per week? Clearly not enough. Make sure they can choose a book at the appropriate level, not something too difficult, not something too easy. Can they monitor their reading? Can they think, oh, this is too difficult or oh, this is too easy? Can they monitor their reading and then say, mm, I need to stop reading this one or uh, this is too easy. I need to find something else. Can they monitor their reading? You know, can they ask a question like, do I understand this? That kind of question. You also need to make sure that they feel comfortable asking you if they have any troubles. If they're having trouble finding the right material, they don't know what to do, they don't understand something, but they want to, they have to know that you're available for them. From a teacher's perspective, it's also important to check that they are actually reading and not faking it. This is particularly true in classes where reading is required. Where reading is required, but students' motivation is low, sometimes students may want to cheat. And therefore you need to make sure that they are reading. So one way to do this is to test them. The problem is of course, that every student has a different book. So how are you gonna test them on that? Well, one way is to use the mreader.org website, which you'll learn a lot, a lot about at the conference here. So um, another thing to do is to check that they are reading by giving them follow-up activities. Ask them to talk about their book. Ask them to speak about it. If they can't speak about it, you know they're not reading it. And try to make sure that they're motivated to keep reading. And this is really useful when they share their reading with other people. So you need to also, as a teacher, think about what you are doing in class. If you are teaching the alphabet or the phonics, you're doing lots of vocab building, you're working with flashcards and spelling, or you're teaching with a teaching book with lots of reading skills, Activity, exercises, comprehension, questions we do together. If you're using a reading textbook, you're building the linguistic foundation. You're building intensive reading, study reading, pre-extensive reading. This is not extensive reading. Your role as an extensive reading teacher changes. If your role is to manage a library of reading materials, you're monitoring their reading, assigning follow-up tasks and watching them read, and reading yourself in front of them, then you're doing extensive reading. So watch the type of activities that you do. If you're doing this, you're doing study reading. If you're doing this, you're doing extensive reading. And we need to have a balance of both of those. So another question you often get is, what's the research evidence for extensive reading? There's a recent book being published here called Teaching Extensive Reading in Another Language. This is a heavy sort of academic book, but 
The question, what is the research evidence for ER is an academic question. So this is one book that you can look at that looks at the most recent research. But if you're really interested, um, the extensive reading benefits, here's a table of how it benefits vocabulary, reading skills, syntax, self-confidence, reading fluency, motivation, writing, TOEIC and TOEFL scores. All of these studies show significant benefits. If you go to the Extensive Reading Foundation website, you can find a bibliography of about six or 700 pieces of extensive reading research. So let's now summarize what we've been doing today. So there's a difference between study reading and reading practice. They have different reading aims and different reading needs. The study reading is about learning to read. Learning to read. This is when it's done with textbooks, worksheets, tests. It's done as a class. Everybody has the same material. We're working on phonics or alphabet or vocab, focus on new words and grammar, reading skills, text structure, and so on. This is learning to read. And it's done very often with head in the hands or a pencil in hand. Reading practice is about reading to learn. And we do this with graded readers where the students choose their own, uh, their own books uh, that they want to read. They are focused on fluency and speed and comprehension and building natural reading practice at their level. And this distinction is common in, uh, in our real life as well. We can compare the difference between learning to drive and enjoying the drive, the drive itself and skilled driving. When you learn to drive, what do you do? You have a rule book. Where do you go? You go to a, to a school. What do you, who do you have sitting next to you? You have a teacher sitting next to you. This is exactly the same as learning to read. We have all of these things. It's help building the knowledge about reading or about driving and practicing the skill in a very controlled environment. And we have a test. However, when you've passed your test, you then read, read fluently, you drive fluently, you enjoy the skill of driving, you become a proficient driver. And so this difference is relevant, not only for driving, but also for sports, for uh, many, many different things. So as a final quiz, which materials should we use for extensive reading? Storybooks or textbooks with exercises? Well, clearly storybooks is the way. Should the reading be easy or a little difficult? Well, if you look at the text on the right, it's very, very difficult. So the key here, of course, is the material should be easy. Should the students be reading quickly or slowly and carefully? Hopefully not using their finger. Of course, fast and enjoyably is the right way to go because we're trying to build reading speed, natural fluent reading ability. Should students use a dictionary when doing extensive reading? Well, maybe sometimes, maybe once every two pages or three pages. Any more than that, it becomes study reading. Nothing wrong with study reading, but it's not the type of reading we need to build fluency and uh, reading speed. Should students be studying the vocabulary and grammar when they read or reading for fun? Well, clearly they should be reading for fun. Um, that's the kind of practice we should be doing for extensive reading. So in a summary, here are some of the reasons we must do extensive reading. Now, when I say we must do, doesn't necessarily mean you must do, but somebody in your school, if you have a child of your own or if you're teaching children, um, everybody is going to need massive fluent reading and listening practice. Everybody is going to do that. Whether you do it or somebody else does it doesn't matter. What matters is somebody is doing it in your school. And we do that to provide massive fluent reading practice. We need to meet lots and lots of words to recycle important useful grammar time and time again to build long-term acquisition to consolidate and strengthen partly known language, to build reading speed, to build depth of knowledge, and to be enjoyable so that they read more. If you want to find out more about extensive reading, then I suggest that what you do is to um, uh, 
to look at the ER Foundation website. If you look at the guides to extensive eating, you can see guides in many, many, many different languages. And I hope that your language is here. So the guide to extensive reading is a 16 page free download PDF available for you to uh, learn about what extensive reading is, why do we do it, how do we do it, some tips and hints about how to set up a library, lots of hints about extensive reading activities and the types of materials that you use. So please take a look at this guide as well. Please also check out the ER Foundation org um, YouTube channel. There's many, many, many more videos here for you to have a look at to build your knowledge about extensive reading. And thank you for your time today.